Hello, get ready for polynomials review. Maybe you have a notebook, paper and pencil in hand. You could have your practice test, however it is that you want to use this video. You could watch the whole thing. You could try to jump to a part that addresses a skill that you want to work on. I think that as the first video that we've done this year, uh, this would be a good way for people that have missed a lot of class to try to catch up. So I hope this has some value to you. Let's get started. We're going to begin by learning how to classify polynomials. And if you don't have this anywhere in your notes, just understand this is a big idea in terms of how we're going to be talking about polynomials. You guys need to understand how to have the degree of a polynomial in mind and also the number of terms that it has. So when you're working with the polynomial you want to be able to understand what an exponent is so we'll talk about that more clearly but i think keeping this chart handy until you memorize it and you understand how to use this and these problems at the beginning of the test should not really take you that long to do once you have this uh this concept down so we have monomials which are a polynomial with one term binomials which are a polynomial with two terms when it has three terms we call it a trinomial and when it has more than four terms we don't really have any fancy words that we use for them most commonly we'll just call it a polynomial with however many terms we count and so we'll talk about how we count terms we'll practice that but the idea is a term is going to be separated by addition and subtraction that's how we'll keep track of how many terms we have so uh, we're counting the number of things that we are adding for us to be able to uh, to break down whether we have a binomial, a monomial, or a trinomial. And then again, in Math 1, you guys learned a little bit about linear functions. And now in Math 2, we're stepping up to quadratic functions with a degree of 2. And so a lot of times you did your linear functions and you didn't think about the exponent, but your x, it was a little invisible one as the exponent. And so there was a variable there, and those are linear functions when you have a variable with the exponent of 1. When you have no variable, we call those kind of polynomials just constants. So, you know, in a way, any just regular constant number, like 3, we could call it a constant monomial would be one way to think about these, right? So let's practice this. Let's get into the practice test and talk about how we can apply this. So this first problem here has a binomial and this is a multiple choice problem and so I'm kind of making sure that you have some kind of scaffold to help you out. But to be honest, I'm hoping that you would be able to name these without having to refer to the chart, without having these multiple choice questions. We know that we have a binomial because binomial represents a polynomial with two terms. So in this case, I have negative 6n and we're subtracting six. So don't think of this as three different terms. We definitely don't want to think of the sign as a separate term, right? We would say negative six n is one term and then minus six is the second term. So that's what's happening here. We have two terms, so we call this a binomial. We talked about constants just a second ago and we know this is not a constant binomial because we do have a variable in this expression. So it can't be a. We know it's not a quadratic monomial because we don't have a power of 2. And we know it's not a quartic binomial because we don't have a power of 4. So again, we would call this a linear binomial. And the functions that you studied in Math 1, all of the lines, rise over run, slope, and y equals mx plus b, all of that, you really were studying linear binomials. If we wanted to refer to it that way, we could. So the answer to this one would be a constant sorry a linear binomial and like I said again we're referring to the number of terms by counting what expressions we're adding and subtracting within the bigger expression okay so we would consider this as two terms let's take a look at the next one this next one again if we want to identify the degree of our polynomial we're gonna look for the biggest exponent Again, there's an invisible one right here, and we have a constant term, we have a linear term, 
and we have a quadratic term. That's how I would talk about these in class. So we've been using this vocabulary for a while. We look at the biggest exponent. In this case, we see a power of 2. And that's how we classify this polynomial in terms of degree. So I would know that this is a quadratic polynomial. So now that would tell you, okay, cubic is out and constant is out because it's not, you know, there's variables. So obviously it can't be a constant. So now let's take a look. It's either C or D. Now, why is it not a quadratic binomial? Well, that's because we don't have two terms. We have three terms up here. So we would call this a quadratic trinomial. And like I said, we have a quadratic term, we have a linear term, and we have a constant term in this trinomial. So this concept is something that we could work on with more review. If you feel like you need more practice with this topic, definitely let me know. But individually, I think we all struggle with different parts. So if you know that vocabulary is gonna be an issue, then you know I would focus a little harder on this topic. I gave you guys a practice the other day that had about eight or nine, maybe 10 uh, examples of this topic. So if we need more practice on this, then definitely you could ask for that, request that, and I can give you more examples. But you know, hopefully uh, we can move on here for the practice test and move on to the next question. Now in this case, it says simplify each expression. And what we want to make sure that we do in this case, and honestly, I worked on this um, many weeks ago when we, we first learned this topic, and I realized that there were some big ideas that somehow everybody was great at doing subtraction, and when it came to addition, we got more mistakes on the little quiz I gave. And so it was interesting, and I realized that I tried to mention to you guys that, you know, when we're adding, the parentheses don't really matter. And so I always kind of skip this one step. And I feel like that actually did cause people some, uh, some mistakes. And so if we were to work on this right now, we would get 7b squared and what I'm doing here is I'm basically going to just drop the parentheses. When we're adding, we can drop the parentheses. They don't matter. As long as we copy all the signs and everything else, we can move on. So I believe on subtraction, I focused, I emphasized that, and I realized that now with addition, that was the one part that I forgot to mention, right? I figured that it went without saying it. Maybe I shouldn't have made that assumption, right? So here we have just to drop the parentheses in both cases and just copy the whole problem. And I'm hoping that that'll stop some mistakes from being made. So let's go ahead and do this problem. So we have 7b to the fourth power minus 2b cubed. And then we have to just drop the parentheses. So now I can copy everything else that's up here. So I have plus 8, plus 8b squared, and minus b to the fourth. Now I did teach everybody to classify these according to the highest exponent. We wanted to start with the biggest exponent. And from there, we wanted to have the exponents decrease. So I taught you guys to basically do that all in one step. I suppose we could take the time to write all of these and maybe uh, first rearrange them and then combine them. I think once you become fluent in this, it's not the hardest thing in the world to just go ahead and start with what I'm doing. So I'm going to look for the biggest exponent. In this case, the biggest exponent that I can see is 4. So I'm going to look for the other expressions in here that have also an exponent of b to the 4. In this case, I have negative b to the 4. And so I'm going to combine those two. And like we said, there's like an invisible one right here, right? So if I have 7b to the 4s, and I'm taking away 1b to the 4th power, then that means I have 6b to the 4th power. Now I need to look for the next biggest exponent, and in this case, it's 3. So I have a cubic term, and I don't see any other cubic terms in our expression. So that means that that one is not going to change. That can't be combined with anything else. So I'll keep that one there. Now I need to look for the squares, right? Where are our quadratic terms? So in this case, I have 7b squared. I have one quadratic term, and I have another quadratic term here that's 8b squared. So 
So in this case, I can add up those coefficients. And the coefficients are, of course, the number that are in front of the variables that indicate that we're multiplying. So 7 plus 8 gives me 15. So I should have 15b squared. And last, we would look for linear terms. And in this case, I don't see any linear terms, right? So in that case, we don't write them. And now we see our constant term is positive 8. Again, I don't see any other constant terms, so that cannot be combined with anything else. So it stays just like that, OK? So this is the way that we carry out this operation. I'm hoping that this rings a bell. We've had longer lessons on this one topic. And again, this is just a review session for me to kind of refresh your memory. So we're not going to dwell on these examples too much. But you know, I do realize that maybe I forgot to tell you to drop the parentheses because adding doesn't really, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not we group those in a different way when we're adding those two uh, expressions the way they're grouped. So if you see a plus in between two parentheses, we can go ahead and drop the parentheses and just combine the terms as needed. OK, so notice nothing inside of here changed its sign at all. All we did was drop the parentheses and copy what was inside. All right, so now for the next one, we're going to take a look at number four, where actually we have a subtraction example. And for this example, we're going to have to talk about the technique that I just mentioned to you, which was basically dropping uh, the parentheses is not something that we should do in this case because we have a negative. And so that means something when we're talking about the negative being outside of the parentheses, right? We have to distribute that negative one. It's one way of looking at it. I've tried to simplify the process for you by saying, let's just copy this first parentheses. Nothing changes there. But now what we have to watch out for is the fact that this negative is outside of these parentheses. And that means that I will have to change the sign of everything inside the parentheses. To make our life easier, let's do that in this step. So I want to emphasize the fact that this doesn't have a sign right now. And if something doesn't have a sign, then you know that means it's positive when it's leading right here. So we know that this is a positive x squared. So now I'm going to have to write it as a negative x squared. If there was a minus sign there, then again, I would change that to a positive. Okay, likewise here, we have a positive 4 to the x to the 4th power. And that means that I'm going to have to change this positive into a negative. So I have negative 4x to the 4th power. And lastly, I see a negative 2x. And so I do have to change that negative into a positive. So now, this step is complete, and we have eliminated the parentheses and now we can just combine our like terms like usual and we can move on so if we take a look here we have no other cubic terms in this expression right we have six terms up here that we have to combine and there's only one cubic term okay so that's one thing I identified there's also no other quartic terms if you look a little farther you see the biggest exponent is really four and not three so I should start my polynomial with this one I'm gonna start with the biggest one if there was another x to the fourth, I would add the coefficient with that one. But in this case, there isn't. So the x to the fourth will stay by itself. So we'll have negative 4x to the fourth power. And now I'm going to have to look for the next biggest exponent. In this case, it's a 3. So now we'll have plus 3x to the third power. Now this deal with the quadratic terms and in this case we see that they're going to cancel each other out i have a positive x squared and a negative x squared and so in this case we're taking away what we have we're subtracting exactly what we have there so that means that we're not going to have any left right so in this case we don't write anything for the quadratic terms now we're going to look for the next thing which would be the linear term and so i have negative 7x and i have to add 2x to that so that should give me negative 5x, OK? I don't see any constant terms up here. And so we're done now, and we've combined everything that we could have combined. I've seen people do this on their worksheets any number of ways by kind of crossing out the ones that they've already dealt with and already combined with something else so that you make sure you have like a checklist for doing all of them. Eventually, I don't think you necessarily need all of that, but everybody has their own way of working through problems like this. 
So do whatever works for you as long as you're getting the right answer, that's fine with me. But again, you know, we're learning how to be fluent with all these exponents and coefficients. So like I said, when you subtract, uh, make sure that you're actually changing the sign of everything and the parentheses, and you should be fine. So again, that was stuff from the beginning of the quarter. We should be able to move on now. The next topic that we have to address is finding products. So multiplying out polynomials, or in this case, we have a binomial. And you can see we'll be practicing some of that language. So in this case, we have to find the product. And I'm hoping you understand the word product. The product of two numbers is what we get when we multiply. And so I hope you guys understand that, you know, to square a number, in this case, m plus 11, you know, don't lose sight with all these things that we're learning with symbols. m plus 11 just represents some number. And now that it's in parentheses, we're saying, hey, this number that's represented by m plus 11, square that number. And to square a number means to multiply it by itself. So this is telling me that it wants us to do n plus 11 times n plus 11. So we'll write out our work like this. Okay, when we do the FOIL method to multiply these things out, something that you guys should be well versed in by this point because we've been doing it for a while. But we'll practice it just to brush up on it. Okay, so we do the first times is the first. So we'll do n times n. And that will give me n squared. Then I have to do n times 11. Okay, the outside terms. Then we'll get 11n. Now I'll end up doing 11 times n. And that will again give me 11n. And lastly, I'm going to multiply 11 times 11. And that'll give me 121. So we see our quadratic term. And I've been using this vocabulary for a while to make sure that we build it up. That quadratic term doesn't have another, another uh, like term that we can combine it with. So that's not going to change. That can't be changed. That stays as n squared. But this part we can simplify. These are our two linear terms. And so 11n plus 11n makes 22n. OK? And the 121 in this constant term, that can't be changed either. So we will have 121, and this would be a completed example uh, of how to multiply out binomials. And that's what this section of the, the practice exam is about, is multiplying out binomials, right? So we'll do another example. I would encourage you at certain times in this video, right before you get a problem, maybe you could try it out yourself and go through the process with me rather than just watching and um, make sure that you're actually getting some practice in, right? So whether you have your notebook or a worksheet, however you want to think about this, um, you know, these concepts are going to be important. And so like I said, feel free to pause the video right now and, you know, work on this problem yourself and then see where you went wrong and maybe you'll have like a question that'll, that'll result in more learning uh, as a result of you actually practicing, okay? So here we go. We'll start with the first times the first. k times k gives us k squared. And now I can do k times positive 5. That will make 5k. Now we'll do negative 5 times k. And that gives me negative 5k. And lastly, we have negative 5 times positive 5. So that should give me negative 25. Okay, we should immediately recognize this form as a difference of squares because we have k minus 5 and k plus 5. The only difference between those two expressions is a plus and a minus. So I'm hoping that some of you guys are going to be able to do this problem really quick by saying, hey, wait a minute, these two linear terms are going to cancel out because it's a difference of squares and we know we can follow the difference of squares pattern. So some students might be able to skip straight to this step, in which case that would be good. That would mean that you're seeing patterns, and that's, uh, that's important in math. So this problem would be done. Again, those linear terms canceled out, and we're just left with the quadratic term and the constant term.
for the next example, it looks like we finally have two terms where the linear term will not cancel out. So let's work this one out and see what we get. If we do n times n, we get n squared, of course. And now if I get n times negative 5, we get negative 5n. Negative 2 times n gives me negative 2n. And then if I do a negative 2 times a negative 5, that gives me positive 10. So n squared cannot change. But again, you can see the linear terms are going to be something we'll have to deal with. So we have negative 5n minus 2n. And this gives us negative 7n plus 10. Okay, this is how we would get this product. And in this case, this problem would be done. And this is the way we should proceed. Again, if you're making mistakes in a certain place or you're stuck at a certain uh, spot, try to make a note of that. Maybe draw a star in your notes, an asterisk or something, so that I can, um, so I can understand where it is that you're going wrong because that's going to be kind of a kind of important, right? If you have a question that's on a certain spot but you can't express what that question is, then maybe just bring the step where you get stuck and then we can discuss that at least. So again, a product, we have a times a, that will give me a squared. a times positive 2 gives me positive 2a. Negative 8 times a makes negative 8a. And then negative 8 times positive 2 makes negative 16. So combining our terms, once again, if I have 2a and I take away 8a, we should have negative 6a minus 16. And that would be our answer. So this is one way to show your work. There might be some ways that people could do it in their head. And again, these problems on the test aren't multiple choice. They're free response. So, you know, I would like you to show your work, of course, um, but when the clock is ticking, you know, you're going to have to get something down on the paper. So I hope this process makes sense. We'll move on to another, uh, to another topic, and we're done multiplying uh, these binomials out. The next section of the test uh, is about factoring. And I've mentioned how this is going to be a deep topic that we'll go into for a while, but we're just kind of seeing the surface of it right now. And so we've talked about how in order to factor a polynomial, we're doing what we just did, but now we're going backwards. Okay, so I'm still trying to show you guys how to read uh, these polynomials, these quadratics. And we know that if I multiply n times n, that'll give me n squared. So in all of these examples, I tend to focus on ones that have a positive leading coefficient. I've given you the simplest versions of these uh, problems and they'll get harder. So we really need to master doing these versions so that the more complex versions um, you know, are something that you'll be capable of. We know the first step is that I have an N and an N. I've tried to break this down for you guys to look at these signs, okay? We've said that if the constant term is positive, then that tells me there's two possibilities, right? Two possibilities. Either, let's consider both of these right now so that you get the thinking process, okay? Either both of them are positive or both of them are negative, right? Those are the only ways to get a positive number through multiplication. If I do a positive times a negative, that will make a negative. So I know it's one of these two. Maybe it's a negative times a negative. Maybe it's a positive times a positive. This is the thought process you should have. But then we should look at this term. And I see the linear term right now is positive. So when we do this problem, we're looking for two numbers that have a product of nine. Okay? So I'm looking for two numbers that if I multiply them, I get nine. That's what product means. I'm also looking for two numbers that have a sum of positive six. So I put that on the board the other day, and I think a couple of students felt uh, somewhat confused by it. But it's like I said, we're solving a system of equations. I'm looking for two numbers, call them a and b in this case. I want a times b to make nine, and I want a plus b to be equal to six. Now, this is what we're solving, and you know we start with nice small numbers, and little by little the problems will get more complex. But you know you should always consider what kind of numbers can 
can make a product, you know, what, what numbers have a product of nine. Don't ever forget one times a number is always itself. So there's always going to be that possibility. One times nine obviously makes nine. So sometimes a student will try every single possibility and forget that, you know, you could try one times uh, the number itself. We also know that three times three is nine. Okay, for this version of the class, everything is factorable by integers and eventually we'll get to problems that are going to not have integers and that's where things will get more complicated. So we need to be sure that at least this first basic examples are mastered. So I know it can be one times nine as the, as the full answer. I know these two numbers can't be the answer because even though a times b in this case one times nine does make nine, one plus nine is ten and it's not six. So that's not going to be the solution to our system here. However, I know 3 times 3 is 9, that's why we chose them, but I know 3 plus 3 is 6. So that tells me this must be the answer. And the big idea, and that's why I said that we can eliminate the possibility that we have two negatives here, because we have a positive number. If I have two numbers that are going to add up to a positive number, how could they possibly both be negative? It's just not possible, right? A negative plus a negative will definitely result in a negative value. So that's the kind of analysis you have to do to be able to solve factoring problems. Like I said, first think about the signs and then start to consider the numbers and the combinations of those. And then little by little, the problem gets smaller and smaller. So of course, in this case, um, we have n plus 3 times n plus 3. And if we wanted to factor that even further, we could write that as n plus 3 squared. All right, these two things are the same. These two expressions are the same, but they look different. And you know, you should be kind of aware that maybe it'll look like this sometimes, maybe it'll look like that, but they're really not so different. All right, so that's our first factoring example. Let's go over that. This is one of the things that I'm more concerned with. And again, some people are catch on to this really quickly. Other people need way more practice until they start to feel like they, uh, they're really grasping the concept. So let's go ahead and set it up. Like I said, put an equal sign. Give yourself some blank parentheses. Okay. Notice the variable in this case is P squared. So we'll have a P here and we have P right there. Now we have to analyze, looking at the linear terms. Again, we're looking for two numbers that will have a product of negative 6 and a sum of 5. Now, in the last example, we had our constant term was positive. But in this case, it's negative. So consider again the idea of the system, where we're looking for two numbers, a and b. Now they have to have a product of negative 6. And if I add them, they will have to have a sum of positive 5. So think about it. If these two numbers are multiplied and they make a negative, they both cannot possibly be positive, nor can they both be negative, because a negative times a negative also makes a positive. So what I know for sure is that one of these is positive and one of these is negative. Now we just have to make sure that the values that we put in there actually have a sum of positive 5. So if we consider, and eventually most of this work will be done in your head, but for now I'm giving you numbers just to kind of show the thought process that goes with it, right? We said that you'll always have 1 and 3, uh, sorry, in this case 1 and 6, right? Because we need to get a product of 6. So I know we have 1 and 6 to think about, but there's also 2 and 3, okay? Now we just have to figure out where they go. Which one is the 2, which one's the 3, which one is the 1, and which one's the 6? Well, there's really no, you know, is there any kind of way that I can combine these two and end up with a positive 5? Can I possibly combine these two and end up with a positive 5? You know, 2 plus 3 is positive 5, but notice that one of them is going to be negative and one's going to be positive. So if I did either positive 2 and negative 3 and combine those, I get negative 1. And if I have positive 3 and negative 2, that would end up giving me positive 1, right? So I can't possibly use those values. That's not going to work, okay? 
So what we, we talked about, I think, in class today, a lot of people started to see, like, hey, when this value is positive, then I know whatever is the biggest of these two values should be the one that is positive because I'm not going to be taking more away than I have. So that will result in making sure that I have a positive number. So here we should have plus 6, and here we should have minus 1. And that should ensure that this works out. Now to figure out why this works, we could do what we did on the last set of multiplying uh, binomials out, and we could see that in fact we get the right answer. And so there's a little bit of intuition that you have to develop to get these problems correctly. But again, they do these numbers do what we want them to do, right? 6 times negative 1 makes negative 6, and 6 plus negative 1 makes positive 5. So that's really all that's happening here. Again, you should always feel free to check your own work. So I guess we could look at an example of how to check our work to see if it's correct. So maybe, um, let's just make a little note here. Okay, checking work. And then we'll get p plus 6 times p minus 1. And then we can just multiply it out, which is a step that I think is a little more straightforward and factoring, which takes a little bit of intuition, like I said. So p squared, p times negative 1 makes negative p, p times 6 makes 6p, and then 6 times negative 1 makes negative 6. And if we combine all these things, we should see, of course, the quadratic term can't change, negative p plus 6p does make 5p and then again the constant term can't change of negative 6 so you could see this is what we wanted to get okay this is equal to that and so that means that we factored it correctly right if I multiply these things together I get what I wanted to get and therefore we factored it right that's what factoring means to write some number as two numbers that have a product of the first number that we talked about. So we'll keep practicing. We got a few more examples to do here. Number 11, we will do, and this one, again, you should read that the variable is a B. So after you put the equal signs, after you put the parentheses, we can start off putting the variable that is a B. Okay, and now again, we want to go analyze what's happening. Do we have two negatives? Do we have two positives? Do we have a negative and a positive? Well, in this case, we see we have a positive value here. So I'm looking for two numbers that if I multiply them, I'll get positive 4. But now we see that if I add these two numbers, I have to get negative 5. And so if you consider the fact that they both can't be positive, because I can never add two positive numbers and get a negative number. So I know, that in this case, both uh, of these values that are going to be in the binomial will be negative. And now again, I'm looking for different ways to multiply two integers and get four, okay? And like I said, it will not always be integers, but for this first round of testing, we're going to master the way this works with integers, and eventually uh, the numbers will be more complicated. So now which one should we try? Well, if I do negative 2 minus 2, if I were to put those in there, they'd have the right product, but they wouldn't have the correct sum. If I do negative 2 minus 2, I get negative 4. So we know it's not that one. So we could try 1 and 4. What about that? Okay, well, negative 1 minus 4 does make negative 5. And so that tells me that this would be the answer here. So like I said, uh, working through the problem, making it smaller, making sure that you at least start the problem. I noticed that some students, you'll, you, might, uh, you might get confused from the beginning and then just fail to write anything. And you want to at least get something down and try to narrow down the problem and make it smaller and smaller. That'll help you out. So in this case, we can try, like I said, put an equal sign, put these parentheses, all of these things could be done even if you don't know what the answer is as long as you understand that we are factoring again that's the word that should give you the cue that you're doing this okay I have to write this as the product of two binomials to use some of our vocabulary 
and then you take a look at the coefficient of the constant term, right? We're looking for two numbers that have a product of negative 24 and two numbers that if I add them will give me a sum of negative 2. A lot of people aren't going to be maybe writing this system of equations uh, and you'll be doing some of this in your head because you get the way to think about this. And this is honestly something that takes intuition after a while. You just kind of build this and you'll, you'll be used to it and you won't have to write so much down. I'm writing these things down, I think, especially to make clear the line of reasoning that I'm making. So just understand, I'm not necessarily expecting you to do this every time to show your work, but it can help you when you're kind of confused as to what's going on. So now we have a bigger number for our constant term. 24 has kind of a lot of factors that we could think about, right? We have one and 24, we have two and 12, we have 8 and 3, and we got 6 and 4. So there's a lot of ways to think about this number, which values will go in there, okay? And so this is going to be more, you know, more to think about, more to consider. But at the same time, like I said, before you even get into the numbers, before you do any of that, you should start thinking about the signs that go here. So if I know that these two numbers have to multiply and become a negative, if I know their product is negative, and that tells me that one of them is positive and one is negative. Now I only have to figure out which number goes where. Well, some of you guys are going to develop the intuition and be able to run through all these combinations in your head. Some of you might need to try all of them. And it's up to you. The most important thing is, of course, that you get it right. But there also is a test involved. So you want to be sure that you kind of, you know, are working at a certain pace. So... I think one thing that's important to see is when you have a negative number here in this middle case, we know that, again, that means that the bigger value should be the negative one, right? So I know that 3 minus 8 isn't going to give me negative 2. And the same thing with 12 and 2 or 24 and 1, but I know 4 minus 6 will give me negative 2. So this must be the right one. And like we said, when this is negative, when this middle term is negative, that means whatever is the bigger value that should be the one that gets the negative. So in this case, the 6 will get the negative and the 4 will be positive. And we know we've done our work correctly. Okay, you could try to verify that on your own in your notebook right now. Multiply that out and see if we actually get what we're supposed to get. But sure enough, you'll find that that is the answer. So let's move on. I believe we're into a new section now. So we've covered factoring and multiplying. Now we're looking at a the rules of the exponents, which is something that will be more involved, but it's definitely embedded in every other uh, example that we're doing. And just to drive these points home, we're using more complex examples than we probably would get while we're working through quadratics. So that's one reason why I didn't emphasize this particular topic, but we still need to be sure that we know how to use it. So the big idea here is that we don't just start multiplying everything and just start adding numbers all over the place. We want to make sure that we know what's happening. And so when we talk about definitions, I mean, we can, we can follow the formulas that I gave you. In one case, we wrote this formula where we saw that, uh, you know, a to the n times b to the n, right? There's not necessarily a way to combine those because we have different values, right? So, I mean, I could probably make a problem up here and people will start erroneously combining things, right? This pattern, this formula that we're going to use is something that we're going to use when we have the same value for our base. So, if I have a to the n and a to the m, now notice the base is the same value, right? The base is the same value. And the exponents, if we're multiplying these two expressions together, we can add them together. And this formula is something useful to make us do our math a little faster. Okay? So the same idea would work if we had three of them. Since I have the base is the same in all of these, I can combine those exponents and make sure that I add them and don't multiply them. But we still need to multiply the coefficients, right? 
So again, the order of multiplication doesn't really matter. So we can simplify this a lot of ways. We can go a longer way, we could go a slower way. Um, I'll try to show a lot of what's happening, I guess, just for the case of this video. So think about what this means. This means three times n times n times n times n. You can see if I write all these n's, we're gonna have a lot of n's up here, but let's, let's continue, okay? And if I did it again, this means multiply that by two, by n, by n, by n, by n. And then last, I have to have a three, and then I'll have to have four n. So n times n times n times n, okay? <laughs> so you can see this is gonna be a lot of writing, and we wouldn't necessarily wanna do our math that way. So the way that we're gonna think about this, instead of just writing as much as possible, is realize we have a notation to help us do these things faster, right? So I could rearrange some of this. We could think about, let's put all the coefficients together on one side, three times two times three, and then I have n to the fourth times n to the fourth times n to the fourth. All we really did was rearrange it. We haven't really simplified anything yet, but I'm gonna try to use this to point out what's happening here before we get done with this example. 3 times 2 is 6, and 6 times 3 is 18. So we should have 18 as our coefficient. And now in this case, we have n to the 4 times n to the 4 times n to the 4. And because the bases are all equal, and because we're multiplying these values together, that means that we can add the exponents. Okay? So in this case, we'll do 4 plus 4 plus 4, and that is 12. So this should be a final answer that you get here. We could do this example much slower and we could try to break it down and keep breaking it down and breaking it down. But at some point, I feel like we have to gain some fluency and just understand that this is a process that you might make some mistakes at it and those are kind of meant to happen so that we can you know, point out how to be more precise with our notation. So this one is done, 13 is complete. We'll move on to the next rule that I was trying to focus on, which was uh, when we take an exponent to another exponent. So again, if you consider the definition of exponent, it's telling us to multiply whatever we're raising to that power that number of times. So this is telling me, hey, take this thing inside the parentheses and multiply this by itself three times. So we're going to do 2x cubed times 2x cubed times 2x cubed. This is how we're extracting some meaning from what we're looking at. And now I see, okay, well now that means that I'm doing 2 times 2 times 2. And then I'm doing x cubed times x cubed times x cubed. So as I work on this, Some people might be thinking that we're making this take a little longer, but again, I'm just trying to make sure that we understand what all of this means. And now we can see this is really just an application of the last rule that we learned. So two times two is four, four times two is eight. So again, two times two times two is eight. And since I'm multiplying equal bases, right? Our base is equal, now we can add the exponents. So I'll do three plus three plus three, right? And that means 8x to the 9. So this is one way to do it. Again, like I said, we're trying to extract meaning from it. I could talk about other ways to do this problem, but I think we've kind of covered it. Of course, there's always another way. You guys might notice that this is like 2 to the third power and 3 times 3 makes 9. So let's talk about that method I guess of doing it even though they're all basically equivalent as long as you're counting things the right way there's nothing different really happening so again when we have this exponent that's outside of the parentheses let's consider the fact that there's an invisible one okay so one of these rules that we're learning here is this idea that like x to the a to the power of b is equal to x to the a b and so that applies to whatever number is inside also. We can multiply this value times all the exponents of everything inside the parentheses. 
So three times one makes three, but three times three makes nine. So instead of raising x to the third power, we should raise x to the ninth power. Okay, and if you consider what two to the third means, that means two times two times two, and like we said, that's eight. And so we could have eight x to the ninth. So you might be thinking this is less writing, so it's better, but I'm also trying to make sure we understand why we have uh, what we have as our answer. So again, that's the power rule. Let's continue here. And this next one is gonna be what happens when we're dividing equal bases. What happens with the exponents? So I'm sure when everybody was learning to simplify fractions, we learned um, that you can cancel things that are on the top and bottom of the fraction because if you multiply by something and then divide by it right after, it's like it never happened, it becomes one. So on top we have five x's because that's the definition of x to the fifth, right? The definition of x to the seventh, again, is to multiply x seven times. So before I, you know, kind of jump into the shortcut rule, let's make sure we understand what's happening here. Well, again, like I said, if there's something on the top and bottom that's multiplying, that's a factor of the entire numerator and the denominator, then we can cancel that out. And so since we have nothing but multiplication happening on top and bottom, we can cancel these out. Okay, so I can cancel that one, we can cancel that, we can cancel that, we can cancel that, and we can cancel that. And so now you just don't want to start believing that there's a zero on top, right? We could consider the fact that this would be equal to all of that times one, and so there's an invisible one that still belongs there as the numerator. And then we see on bottom we have x times x, which we could simplify as x squared. So that's one way of doing the problem so that you understand it. And this was just my way of showing you the rule and why it works that if we did x to the a divided by x to the b, then it's true that we could write x to the a minus b, paying extra attention to the fact that the one that we subtract is the value in the denominator, the value of the exponent in the denominator. And this only works because we have our bases that are both x. If this was x and that was y, we would not be able to use this rule. So again, let's do it the shorter way, and then at least we'll be able to talk about the definition of negative exponents. And we'll move on out of these exponent rules to the next set. So one way that you could consider this is say, you have to recognize those bases are equal. We have two x's. And so that means that again, I could do five minus seven because seven is in the denominator, so we can subtract that. This would result in x to the negative two. Five minus seven is negative two. And so we should learn this definition that the idea is that with the negative exponent, we can write it like this if we wanna have a positive exponent, okay? These two expressions are equivalent, they're equal, but they look different. And so our definition of a negative exponent is basically right here. The definition of uh, x to the negative two, we can consider it as this, okay? So we can get deeper and deeper into that and eventually we'll get into rational exponents and we'll focus on these formulas a little more. But for now, I just wanted to expose them to you and so we have three problems uh, that practice that concept. So make sure that you understand the way this works. Um, like I said, if I was to give you a problem like this, I might be able to fool some of you if I said x to the fourth divided by y to the third. You might already try to do this and if you weren't paying attention, maybe you'd say, okay, this is x to the four minus three. But notice that it's not the same number. So since the base is different, you can't apply that rule. That doesn't work. That's not a thing that we can do in this case. It doesn't work that way, okay? This formula only works when the basis would be the same uh, value, same variable. So we're gonna have to move on to the next section. And here we are talking about graphing these multiple choice questions uh, are one way for me to check for understanding instead of just giving you a graph 
instead of just giving you the equation and telling you to draw the graph now, I'm giving you a graph and telling you to give me the equation. And so, in vertex form, we should be kind of used to this idea that we need to find the vertex, right? So, typically when we're graphing, that would be the first thing. If I give you an equation in vertex form, you go put the vertex down, and then you follow the pattern for quadratic growth, and you graph the equation. In this case, we're going to have the opposite happening. So, the first thing that should happen is you should understand where the vertex is, okay? And in this case, if it appears to be a vertex at a lattice point, then the vertex is where it looks like it is to make these problems clear. So our vertex is right there. So we want to understand what the coordinates are of these. Again, in the coordinate plane, we have xy coordinates. So the x always goes first. So in this case, we know that the x coordinate of the vertex is 3 and the y coordinate of the vertex is 2. So we've learned how to use this with our vertex form equation and the idea that we saw is that we know we're going to have x and we know we'll have a binomial that's going to be squared and again to make this problem, you know, this is one of the more simpler forms to work with. We know that this x value, okay, we're going to have to change the sign of this x coordinate inside of the binomial. And this is a pattern that we've noticed in class and we've talked about it that makes life simpler, okay? So, again, this is just review. If I was going to do a whole lesson on vertex form, I'd probably go a little slower. But to make a long story short, we will take this positive 3 and make that a negative 3. Okay? We also learned that the y coordinate does not get changed. And so we'll keep that as a positive 2. One thing that we want to keep in mind is always uh, what I've told you guys about happy faces and sad faces. Okay? In this case, we have a happy polynomial. Okay? So this should be positive. And we know the leading coefficient outside of these parentheses right here, um, it should be positive. And so keep that in mind. So if I was to give you a multiple choice test like this, I'm hoping that you would be able to rule out anything that has a negative leading coefficient in this case. Those negatives would be going opposite. Those would be the sad faces we talked about. And so we could cross out those two and then try to find where our answer would be. In this case, C and D look pretty close. They look similar. But if we were to do the work and practice graphing this form over and over again, we would see that this equation actually gives us the parabola on the other side of the y-axis. And so the answer in this case would be C. And vertex form is something that I think maybe only a few of you guys are still um, trying to master, but I feel like most of us have honestly grasped um, vertex form when the leading coefficient is just one. So let's move on to the next example. I think we have another vertex form example here. And so again, like I said, when the leading coefficient is negative, we should expect to see a graph that goes down instead of up. So in this case, we should have our sad face parabola. And as we see, hey, that's not a happy face. So I know that my answer should not be positive. It should have a leading negative. So that means I could cross out B. So again, if the first thing you do on vertex form is look for the vertex, then you're at least on the right track. So you should say, okay, the vertex is right there. So the coordinates of the vertex are negative 5 and positive 2. So when I write this and observe the rules of the vertex form equation, you know, you should set it up. And then just think for a second to make sure you have the right, uh, the right idea. Okay, like I said, this negative 5 is going to be changed into a positive 5. And that's the way that this form works, okay? So the x coordinate is going to have the opposite sign uh, when we write it in vertex form, whereas the y coordinate of the vertex will have the same sign that it had. So this is a pattern that you need to kind of notice. It makes uh, the transformation of the function a little easier 
to notice that, you know, as we have a positive, it kind of pulls our vertex to the left from the origin, and then the positive two pulls the vertex up. Now, of course, there's one thing I haven't mentioned, and that that is that it's a sad face. So that can tell me, okay, the leading coefficient in front must be negative. And so now I know exactly what I'm looking for. So which example has negative x plus five squared uh, plus two? And we see we have this here. Okay, and so I guess I could talk about this one more time. One more thing we could get out of this is the way to read this out loud, okay? The way I just said it, technically we should say negative the quantity x plus five squared plus two, all right? So usually when we're reading this out loud, um, we would call anything in parentheses, we would say the quantity, and then we'd be able to, uh, to say the rest of it without confusing whoever might be listening. So like I said, negative the quantity x plus five squared plus two, and this is vertex form. So if you have more questions on vertex form and I have to give you more practice to support you, then please uh, let me know as soon as possible because um, I believe the other forms are a little more complex and vertex form is one that helps us out because it gives us the vertex immediately and it makes things easier to grasp sometimes, but it also makes other things harder to see. And like I was telling you, at this point of the year, we're making everything nice and neat. This graph, this polynomial crosses the graph at two integers, and that will not always happen for the rest of the year, right? Later on, the graph is going to cross at some point in between these lines, okay? So right now, I'm just trying to make sure that we get the basic pattern, and then we're going to have more precision later on. So if we know what's happening in intercept form, intercept form is helpful for when we're trying to find where our graph, our parabola, where it crosses the x-axis, okay? So again, a quadratic function is going to make the shape of a parabola. We have our happy faces and our sad faces. In this case, I see a happy face. So I know it's certainly not a negative one, okay? So we could cross out that one, okay? And then I've been using this idea of the happy face to make sure that we have something to refer to. But, you know, we could think of this idea as what we might talk about it in, a, in calculus and upper thing. We would say that this parabola opens upward, right? And we would say that a negative one opens downward, right? So that could be one way that we also refer to this idea of a negative or positive uh, leading coefficient. Okay, so now in factored form, when we're dealing with factored form, it's a little different. And that's why I think you guys could start to see the connection between factoring and graphing is going to be kind of deep and it's something that kind of stays with you for a long time in mathematics uh, when it comes to quadratic functions and even higher order polynomials, um, the factor theorem, which is something that we'll get in there later. But for now, we understand that the factored form or the intercept form, it makes it easy for us to see where it crosses the graph and then vice versa, right, where, it where the graph crosses the x-axis. In this case, I see that the graph crosses the x-axis at positive 3 and negative 7. I'm sorry, positive 7. So what that tells me is that inside of these two parentheses, in these binomials, I'm going to need to put an opposite sign of the value where it crosses the axis. So this positive 3, we're going to write that as a negative 3. And this positive 7 right here, we're going to write as a negative 7. And now this problem is basically done as long as you could find it and as long as you don't get confused by the fact that this is equivalent, okay, to if I wrote it the other way around. There's no difference. When we're first learning math, we can definitely be a little superstitious if we don't know what's happening. But these two things are the same, right? Whether I do x minus 3 times x minus 7 or x minus 7 times x minus 3, they mean the same thing, right? It's the same thing as basically saying that A times B is equal to B times A. There's no difference uh, in the order that we multiply. So in this case, we have our factored form, our intercept form. Uh, equation should be right here. Let's do another example of intercept form. Now that example wasn't too hard. And again, I could make the multiple choice a little tougher to force us to think differently 
about other things that affect um, maybe the vertex or other things, you know, that have similar factors, that have similar zeros. So we'll look at an example like that tomorrow. But for today, working on this practice test, we should see uh, where the graph crosses uh, the x-axis and we'll think about this um, the same way we did last time. Again, notice that it crosses here at the origin, so we think of that as x equals zero, and here it crosses at negative four. And so I know, like I said last time, we have to change the sign of the x-coordinate wherever it crosses the x-axis. So in this case, it crosses the x-axis at negative four, so let's turn that into a positive 4. And now we have 0, and 0 is the one number that's neither, neither negative nor uh, positive, so it doesn't really matter which one we put. Uh, we could just as well put plus 0 or minus 0. Well, likewise, we could simplify a little bit, and we see that x plus 4, that can't change, but x plus 0 is equal to x. Okay, and typically, this wouldn't necessarily be um, wrong, but it's not really the way that we write it. So in mathematics, when we get something like this, we tend to drop this parentheses, and we, we usually put that in front over here. So we factor out toward the left is the way we would call that. And we'll work on this in lots of different ways later on in the year, but this would be the way that we would usually write it, would be don't write the x on the right side it just looks funny to us we put it on the left and we get rid of the parentheses too um, like i said it wouldn't be wrong but also notice the way that the worksheet uh, generator made this and that uh that looks just like the answer that we have there so we can go with d okay there's lots of other things that i could do to make these problems more difficult like i said you should maybe take a look at the way that it's growing right so in this case i see it's going over one up one so that tells me, okay, well, my leading coefficient must be 1 and not some other value. So, you know, make sure that you're taking a, 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 a extra care to look at what those are. But again, in the multiple choice versions, you, you won't have to deal with that too much. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. So now we're off to standard form. And this is one that takes a little more focus compared to the other values. Standard form, like all the other forms, has its advantages. In this case, standard form, uh, the one advantage of that is it tells us where the graph intercepts the y-axis. Just by looking at it, if we look at the constant value, we could see that, okay, it crosses the y-axis uh, right here at 4. So I know that the answer can't be b, because it doesn't cross at negative 4, and I know it can't be a, because it doesn't cross at 0. So standard form, at least we know, hey, this is going to have to be one of these choices where it crosses the y-axis at 4. Um, again, this is no longer intercept form that we're working on. This is standard form. A standard form polynomial is something that we'll be working with for a lot of the first quarter. And it's going to be like a focus point of the whole first semester. So we want to know that the a, we'll call that the leading coefficient. This is the coefficient of x squared, so the coefficient of our quadratic term. We also call that the leading coefficient. And then, of course, we have our linear term. Okay, we consider that one to be b, and a lot of formulas that we'll use. And we call uh, the constant value as a c. And so I think that one also is helpful because it's a constant, and it's also the letter c. So now, we have to figure out which one actually gives us the answer that we want. There's multiple ways that you could do this on a multiple choice uh, exam. One way that you could do this is maybe you could say, hey, I can see that this is the point, this vertex is at the point negative two, right? The vertex is at the point negative two and y equals zero. So you might say, hey, if which one of these two can I plug in negative two and then get zero, and then that must be the answer. That's one way that you could figure out how to do this problem. So we could try that right now. It's just as good as any, any technique to solve this problem because it's multiple choice. So let's calculate f of negative two. And what that means again is that we plug in negative two 
into our uh, equation and figure it out. But notice that if we were to choose D first, we might get the wrong answer. So that's the, the kind of the wrong uh, idea. We don't want to waste time because I know at least if I rule this one out, then I know I have to pick this one, right? So you always want to be careful when you're just kind of plugging in to guess and check. But that is one method that we could try. So in this case, what I've taught you guys to do, let's try D to see whether or not it gives us zero. Okay, so we'll try this one. And what we'll do is we'll plug in a blank parentheses everywhere where we see X. So I saw X squared, so I put blank parentheses squared. I see 7X, so I'm going to do 7 blank parentheses. And then I see 4, so we put that there. So now what we have to do is plug in our value for x. And in this case, we have negative 2. So we can put negative 2 here and negative 2 there. Negative 2 squared means negative 2 times negative 2. So that must be a positive, and it's positive 4. Negative 2 times positive 7 gives me negative 14, though. And now we have to do this uh, operation. So 4 minus 14 gives me negative 10, and negative 10 plus 4 gives negative 6. And negative 6 is not equal to 0. So that tells me that this is not the equation that I want for this graph, because it wouldn't give us the vertex in the right location. So that would tell me I can eliminate this one, and I could try this one. So Again, that would be time consuming if we tried that every time, but it's one technique that you could use, right? So later on, when we practice how to graph the standard form, we'll focus on maybe a way that would be time saving by just actually doing the work and making sure that we just get the right answer um, by doing uh, a little more calculation. So here we have A standard form equation that we have to find and you know one idea that I've been talking about again like I said to kind of stick in your head we have the happy faces and the sad faces and I see this guy is sad so that means that we have to choose one that has a leading coefficient that's negative so once again look I can cross out B and I can cross out C because we know that that's definitely not the answer so again we have it narrowed down to two of them so if we hadn't done that, we would have four different cases to look at, and that might make life a little more difficult if we were going to try the guess and check method. So we'll work with that again, just so at least that you guys can practice how to plug in a value. But we see again here that the vertex is at x equals 1 and y equals negative 5. Okay, those are the coordinates of the vertex again, right? So what I could do is plug in 1 to either one of these equations and then see which one gives me negative 5. And if I get negative 5, I'm going to have a pretty good feeling that I'm dealing with the right equation here, right? So let's go ahead and, and try that just for the sake of it. Let's try, um, let's try A, see what we get. So we'll write f of 1 equals... And then, since I'm copying this one, again, like I said, we have to copy everything, but where I see x, put a blank parenthesis. So again, I see negative x squared, so I change the x into a blank parenthesis. Then I put plus 2, and then I put another blank parenthesis, and now I have minus 6. Okay, since we're calculating f of 1, uh, by definition, that means for me to change 1 for x. So that's what's happening here. So now if we do our calculation, what's going on here, right? I have 1 squared, which is 1, and then now I have to make it negative because this negative is outside of the parentheses. So in this case, we will have negative 1. Now 2 times 1 makes 2. And then we have to be sure that we subtract 6 at the end for this final calculation. So negative 2 plus 1 is 1, and 1 minus 6 is negative 5. And so we see that when I plug in 1, I get negative 5. And so if you follow my reasoning, we basically figured out that this was the answer. 
if we really wanted to be sure we were sure, then we could try this one too, and we could plug in one into that and, and figure out what happens. But again, it looks kind of obvious that if I was to do one squared, I'd get one, and that would turn to negative one, and then I do negative one plus 10, which would make negative nine, right? Uh, sorry, positive nine. And positive nine minus 26 will not give me negative five. So I would be able to eliminate that one also. So again, the multiple choice versions are always something that you want to attack with various strategies. And usually you want to use those strategies when you don't know how to do the problem, um, maybe the traditional way. When you're not sure what to do, then you want to try to attack it every kind of way you could think of. Luckily, you have some things to, to look to to help you out. So for this one, let's try to make the graph a little bigger. Okay, so I uh, almost had it. So for this example, I want to focus on in class especially the idea that the worksheet is asking us to find the vertex and the axis of symmetry. And this is something that we usually have to find anyway on a lot of the problems, but in this case, I'm going to ask you to actually write it on the exam. So if you're following directions, uh, you'll be able to actually tell me what they are. I need to actually see that. And so, like I said, this is a vertex form, so it shouldn't be too much extra work, but I would like you to write vertex. Okay, you don't have to use a complete sentence. We're on the test and we'll have limited time. So you can go ahead and just write vertex, put a colon, and just give me the, uh, the coordinates of the vertex. And in this case, we can see, okay, we're going to be drawing something that is not a happy parabola. This will be a sad parabola. This will be open downward because we know we have a leading negative. So earlier we talked about vertex one when we said, hey, we have to change the sign of the value inside of the parentheses so that we can find the x-coordinate of the vertex. So that'll be negative two. And then we learned that the second one we did not change when we're doing vertex form. So we see that this is going to be positive three. So that tells me where to put the vertex. So I will go to negative two and positive three and put a point there to signify the vertex. Now I've been using this um, example for you guys for a while and we've been kind of used to it, but it's been a little bit since we talked about this in class because we've been working on factoring. So again, in the case where we're doing a negative leading coefficient, instead of going up, we're going down. And so the pattern that I've been trying to get everybody to see, right, is that if we go over one, from the vertex, right? Then that means I have to go down one squared. And likewise, if I go over two from the vertex, then I have to go down two squared. If I go over three lattice points from the vertex, then I would be going down three squared. And this pattern will continue and continue, and you should always continue until you run out of space on the graph. So in this case, let's, uh, let's work on it. And we know we're going down, again, because we have a negative leading coefficient. So again, when we do these, always count back to the vertex. The reason why I'm not saying it is because I want to make sure that you guys hear me. Uh, and you don't start tuning out as the sentence gets longer and longer. The pattern I'm trying to focus on is that the distance that we go from the vertex, it doesn't matter whether we're on the left or the right side, as long as we're going over that far from the vertex, we're going to have to square that amount and then count the right direction. In the case of a positive, we count up, and in a negative, we count down. So let's finish this one. If I go over one, I go down one squared, and that'll be on both sides. If I go over two, then I go down two squared. And of course, you should be able to memorize this and you should memorize it. We know one squared is one, and we know two squared is four, and we know three squared is nine, okay? I'm not having you guys memorize these numbers instead of these ones because I feel like you can calculate these ones in your head. And this is really the pattern of quadratic growth. This shows the idea that we're squaring something, right? So. Again, this is why I'm always talking about um, the idea of over one, down one squared, over two, down two squared, over three, down three squared. And 
you know, it's similar to rise and run, except in this case we're making a curve and not a straight line. So if I go over two steps from the vertex, I have to go down one, two, three, four, and that'll be on both sides. Our symmetry helps us get that. Same thing again, if I go over three from the vertex, it doesn't matter whether I go left or right, but if I take three steps from the vertex, now I have to go down three squared, and three squared means three times three, and that's nine. So we could count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that'll be there on both sides. Okay, then of course we want to draw our graph with a smooth continuous curve. And just try to make the curve stable. Um, it would be nice if you tried to make sure that it didn't cross this line too soon because again that would be going over 4 and then I'd have to go down 16 and that's going to be off the graph but we certainly don't want to just jump straight past 2 so understand it's going to be in between these two uh, points for a while until it gets down 16 squares so this is an example again um, like I said there's a negative leading coefficient so just by looking at this negative sign, I know I have to go down and not up. All right. So this example has a leading coefficient that is not one. And this one always gets a little more errors. People tend to lose that little extra step that comes with this problem because now we're no longer we're no longer going up the same amount that we used to okay so the good thing to know about this form is that the vertex nothing about that changes so the vertex we still consider the same way okay so we'll change the sign of this positive 2 into a negative 2 and again we do not change the sign of the negative 6 that just stays the same so now we know where the vertex is negative 2 negative 6 so I'm going to go down Always make sure that you remember, of course, that this is x, y coordinates. So just make sure that you're counting in the right direction. Usually, we would count to the left for the x first and then do the y next, and we know we're in the right place. Another thing we should see is that the 2 is positive. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about the leading coefficient. That's positive right here, so I know we're going up. This is not a sad one. This is going to be going upwards. This will be a happy parabola. It'll be open upward. So. In this case, when we see this 2, we have a similar pattern from before. If we go over from the vertex, like I said, if we go over 1, if we go over 2, when we're making our, our quadratic growth, as we were talking about it, in this case, since it's positive, we would go up, okay? And like I told you, we'll go up 1 squared, or we'll go up 2 squared. That's what we usually do when the leading coefficient is 1. In this case now, we have another number that's in front, and that's a 2. So that means it's going to be more complicated, but it's not that much more complicated. What that means is now, we have to double all of these values. We have to just multiply them by 2. So if this was a 3, if this was a 4, if this was a 5, if it was a 0.7, no matter what value we have in front here, we would be doing the same quadratic growth, but we would have to multiply it by that number, by that factor, to get us... Uh, something that'll, that'll change the way that it's going to grow. So if you think about it, 1 squared is 1, and 2 times 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4, and 4 times 2 is 8. 3 squared is 9, and 9 times 2 is 18. So it can be kind of tough to graph these things on a small grid that's uh, 8 by 8. So we'll need a much bigger graph paper to kind of deal with some of these problems. So in this case, let's draw the points that we can draw, and then once it goes off the graph, then we just have to deal with that. So if I go over 1 from the vertex, I have to go up 2. If I go over 1 from the vertex, I go up 2, again, because we have this leading coefficient. But now, if I go back to the vertex and take two steps over, I have to go up 8 steps. So, I mean, I'm just going to keep saying this. Like, all of these things that we're doing, these are all from the vertex, okay? This is our shorthand. We've been talking about this for a while. 
And I notice every now and then somebody will, instead of going back to the vertex, they'll say, okay, over two, and they'll go two steps from the point that we were just at. And that's not what I intend for you to do. What I mean for you to do is every time I go back to the vertex, if I go over two, because of that leading coefficient, I should go up two times two squared instead of just two squared. So now I have to take eight steps. So if I go over two, I go up eight steps. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And again, over two, up eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? And then, like I said, don't have your graph cross the line too soon. Because, again, this is going to take 18 steps up before it crosses this line. So do your best to try to make it look right. Again, on this uh, LFD, I didn't do so great of a job on this last parabola. But as long as you could, uh, you know, make it somewhat legible, especially if you have these anchor points on there, um, that's going to be the kind of thing that gets you full credit. I'm not expecting everybody to be Leonardo da Vinci that could draw a perfect curve. Okay, but please do the best you can. At least try to make it look like a parabola. Definitely don't make it look inverted or pointy, like some kind of shape like that. We don't want that to happen, okay? So make sure that it looks curved. So that leaves vertex form behind. And now we're talking about, um, oh, well, one thing that I mentioned on those last two is that we actually didn't do the axis of symmetry on those problems, right? So if I was to, can I bring those pages back? Let's go ahead and talk about that. So, like I said, on 22, it says to do both. So we drew the graph and we did the vertex, okay? But to get that next point, you have to tell me what the axis of symmetry is and it'll be a shame to take a point away because you forgot that and even I forgot that myself right now. So let's double underline that to make sure you guys are focused on that on the test, right? We have to also say what the axis of symmetry is. So the vertex is like we said at negative two and positive three but you also want to notice that the axis of symmetry of a parabola, in this case it's a function of x. So since our parabolas are going up and down right now, we know that in this case our axis of symmetry is going to be the x-coordinate of the vertex. So we'll have x equals negative 2. Okay, and this is always going to be the case as long as our parabolas are going up and down as long as we're doing our function of x. If we had a function of y and we were doing parabolas this way, then obviously it would be the other way around. A parabola can also go left and right. We haven't been focusing on that, but eventually we'll probably have to turn them the other way and think about how that would work. But it's not that different, okay? So as long as we're doing f of x and it's being plotted in the xy plane, then the axis of symmetry will always be the x-coordinate of the vertex. If I was to do it the other way around, then obviously I think we could see that the y-coordinate of the vertex would work if it was a function of y. Okay, but like I said for the exam, we're considering these to be functions of x. So just consider this idea, right? The axis of symmetry always goes right through the vertex. So make sure that along with the graph, you also give me both of these. So again, for this one, we neglected to put the axis of symmetry. So like we said, the vertex was negative two and negative six. And so the axis of symmetry, and I know some people, some of you guys are gonna wanna abbreviate, but I really don't want you to abbreviate because if you never have to write it, you might never really learn this word. And it's important to know the idea, so. Please write it out in full, write axis of symmetry, and just know that it's going to be the x-coordinate of the vertex, again, in this case, because it's a function of x, and our axis of symmetry always goes through the vertex. Again, right, a parabola that's going up and down, our vertex is here, the axis of symmetry is the vertical line that runs through the vertex, okay? so. That's all you really have to do is give me the x-coordinate. 
And the main thing, I know that you can calculate it, obviously. I know you could look at it, but I, I need to know that you understand that that is the axis of symmetry so that we can move on to more complicated things that will deal with transformations. So here we go. We'll make sure that we keep that in mind as we do this 124. And again, like we said earlier, this form is no longer vertex form. So I'm expecting you guys to start identifying forms by looking at them. This form is not vertex form. This is factored form, also known as the intercept form. And so what I taught you guys to do in this case was in order to find the zeros, in order to find the places where it crosses the x-axis, we'd have to change the sign of the constant values inside the binomial. So because this is a positive 4, I know the function is going to be equal to 0 at negative 4. And because this is a positive 2, I know the function will be equal to 0 at negative 2. And so I know both of those points are on our parabola. Again, this is a big idea, and you know we'll be working on this for a while. But I know the function is going to be equal to 0 at those two points, because if I was to calculate f of negative 4, then consider what that would mean. That would mean, OK, I have to plug in negative 4 for my x. So let's just look at what we would have before I plug it in, right? What's my value for x? Negative 4. So we're doing negative 4 plus 4 and negative 4 plus 2. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0. And negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. But it wouldn't really matter what it is, because 0 times anything is 0. So this is what tells me that if the x coordinate is negative 4, then the y coordinate is 0. If it's going to be on the graph, it has to obey this rule that we've set. Right? That's what a function is. It's a, it's a rule that basically gives our inputs, our x values, one y value that we get when we, when we output it. So consider what would happen if we did f of negative 2, just like we have here. Well, if I did f of negative 2, then that tells me I'd have to do negative 2 plus 4 instead of 2 plus 4. And then I'd have negative 2 plus 2 instead of negative 4 plus 2, right? Because now I'm just changing in my negative 2 for these two x values. So if we do that calculation, negative 2 plus 4 is 2. But negative 2 plus 2 is 0. And 0 times anything is 0. So we see the same thing. When I plug in negative 2, then I get 0. And like we talked about, what does graphing mean, right? Graphing means give me all the points that make this equation true, where all their x, y coordinates would make this equation true. Those are the ones we're looking for. And so we keep in mind that the f value of an x value gives us the y coordinate. So I know maybe last year you guys learned you know, things like y equals mx plus b. And now we have a way to talk about our output before we get it. OK, so that's where function notation comes in. We have this notation so that we can talk about what I get when I input something, OK? And we can kind of refer to it before I even get it. So in this case, let's say we had a y equals mx plus b thing. And I would say, oh, what do I get when I plug in negative 2.3 into x? What would y be, right? It's kind of a clumsy phrase that I have to use to refer to it. Whereas now we have a nice, neat term where I could just say, oh, what's f of negative 2? instead of having this whole long sentence to talk about what our output would be if I had a certain input. So that's what's going on with our notation. And again, this is why we have those zeros. So again, we still don't know a lot of things about this graph. The easy parts of the intercept form, like I said, are the zeros. We could put those two points basically just by looking at those two numbers and changing their sign. The big idea that we need now is how do we get the vertex and the axis of symmetry? So one thing that we know is that parabolas are symmetric. And so we're going to exploit that fact so that we can write this whole equation and get this done. So the big idea is that we know that the axis of symmetry should be halfway in between negative 4 and negative 2. So we know our, our axis of symmetry is going to be right here at negative 3. 
okay? And maybe that's easy to know because we have this graph in front of us, but maybe when I put one zero all the way over here and one over there, we might have to count a little harder to see what's directly in the middle. But obviously in between negative four and negative two is negative three. So I guess we just found our axis of symmetry. Okay, it was a little bit harder than when we look at vertex form, but we know that this is gonna be x equals negative three. That's our axis of symmetry. Okay, now we need to figure out what the vertex is. All we know is the x-coordinate of the vertex because the vertex, again, must be on the axis of symmetry. So I know the x-coordinate is negative three. Now I need to figure out what the y-coordinate would be. And to do that, I have to calculate f of negative three by plugging it in to x into this formula. So we're gonna say f of negative three, let's calculate what that is. In this case, it means negative three plus four times negative three plus two. Well, negative three plus four is one, and negative three plus two is negative one. So if I do one times negative one, I get negative one. And so that tells me that the y coordinate of the vertex must be negative one. So now that means I can go put this right there. Well now we obey the same rules of quadratic growth. Again, the leading coefficient of this, if we were to multiply it out, Right. If we did the math, we would say, hey, the leading coefficient is going to be 1. We don't have any other numbers in front of these x's or outside of the parentheses to consider. So we know we're going upward. And we know that if I go over 1, I should go up 1 squared. And if I go over 2 from the vertex, I should go up 2 squared, which is 4. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4. And likewise, if I go over 2 the other way, then 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, if I was to go over three steps from the vertex, then I should go up three squared, which is nine. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, and that's gonna be on both sides of the axis of symmetry, and we can use that to help guide us. So now, just connect these with the smooth continuous curve, and we have our parabola and everything else that we needed, right? We needed to show the vertex and the axis of symmetry. So there we go. Let's do another example. And again, this would probably be, oh, it looks like I, uh, I made this one not intercept form, right? This one looks like it is in standard form. So I feel like on those last problems, it would have been nice if you had stopped to pause it, but maybe some of you guys using this video are maybe feeling like you're not able to actually do some of these. And so that's the interesting thing is that once I show you how to do a problem, now you need like a version so that you can practice that problem. So you probably need more practice on that if one thing is something that you're still trying to master. So um, please, like I said, attend office hours and, you know, definitely pay attention during lecture when we go over these things. But, you know, this resource is mainly for people that have been absent or need to review a specific concept. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the video gives you a, an environment that you can kind of control. Uh, when you you know start and pause it and you know you can you can stop and come back to it when you feel ready so in standard form we have a totally different idea right we need to get the vertex we need to get the axis of symmetry and like we said in vertex form we can get the vertex just by looking at it and in factored form we can get the zeros again the x-intercept i can get those just by looking at it but in standard form the only thing that it really tells me right away is where's the y-intercept? And we can see negative 26 is way off the graph. And so that's not going to help us graph this equation any faster. So we're going to have to do some other work. Of course, we should notice that there's a leading negative. So that should tell me that this is going to be a sad face. So once we do find the vertex, we know we're going down. Okay, and again, once we find the vertex here, we're also gonna find the axis of symmetry. So let's break this down because standard form, 
has a special formula that we're going to use so that we can find the axis of symmetry. And then just like before, we'll plug that in to help us find um, the y-coordinate of the vertex. So in standard form, the vertex has an x-coordinate of negative b over 2a. Okay, that's how we find the x-coordinate. And another word for the x-coordinate, like I said, because we're working with functions of x, that's also going to be our axis of symmetry. So we could also think about, think about this as, um, you know, this function will have an axis of symmetry of negative b over 2a, right? They're interchangeable, but you need to know both of those ideas. So let's go plug in these values and figure out what it, what it would give us, right? In this case, we have negative b over 2a, so let's uh, give ourselves a little more room to work on the same line here. So we have negative b over 2a, okay? One thing that I'm going to show you guys to make sure that you don't mess up with negatives is when you're replacing variables, just always put a blank parenthesis in that step, okay? This will stop you from making a mistake and dropping a negative. In this case, we don't have one, but it's still a good practice. So the value of b is the number in front of our linear term. That's our coefficient of our linear term. So that's a 10. So I see right here, I'm going to put 10 in for b. Okay, we should be able to see that. Now the a value, that is our number in front of x squared. Again, that's our coefficient, the leading coefficient, the coefficient of the quadratic term. And it says negative x squared, and so please don't think that it's zero because that's an invisible negative one. So when you see no number right there, that's a one. So here we have negative one. Okay, make sure we put that in there. So now we have to simplify this a little bit. And to simplify that, we are going to get negative 10. Okay, and then 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. So we are doing a negative divided by a negative, which is a positive, And 10 divided by 2 is 5. So we get positive 5. So luckily, we just found our axis of symmetry. And we also found our x-coordinate of the vertex. I don't want my work to get too sloppy, and if I had more room, I probably would have put that here so that we could continue working. But we know now that our x coordinate is 5. So let me make some room up here so we can kind of collect the important information that we need. Let's write down the fact that we know the axis of symmetry. which is x equals 5, okay? And then we also need to find the vertex. And once we find the vertex, drawing the graph will be pretty easy. We know our x-coordinate is 5. What we don't know is the y-coordinate, okay? And that's something that I think you guys should get used to at this point. Um, I'm going to erase most of this stuff, so hopefully you have that copied in your notes or you could rewind this. So here we go. In order to find the y-coordinate of the vertex, I will have to calculate f of 5. So again, like I said, copy the negative and then put the blank parentheses everywhere that you see x. And after we do this calculation, this problem will be almost wrapped up. So we'll put 5 here, we'll put 5 there, and then we'll calculate. Okay, 5 squared is 25, but we have to make it negative. So that's negative 25. 5 times 10 is 50. So here we have 50. And then that's minus 26. So negative 25 plus 50, that's the same thing as 50 minus 25, right? So that's just 25. And then 25 minus 26 is negative 1. So you can, you know, show all your steps if you want. Maybe we could do this in one step, right? Negative 25 plus 50 is 25. And then we have 25 minus 26, which gives us negative 1. So now I know my x-coordinate of the vertex, which is negative 1. 
And so now finally, we can go write that down. We have five and negative one. That's our vertex. Now, again, like I was gonna ask you, is this a sad face or a happy face? This is a negative leading coefficient, so that means we'll be going down as we take every step away from the vertex. So if I go over one, I gotta go down one squared. If I go over two, I have to go down two squared, which is four. And if I go over three, I have to go down nine steps, which would be just barely off the graph. And in that case, we will not have to put those points. And so make sure that your curve goes through your anchor points. And there we go, we have a graph. So everything that we needed is here, three points on these problems. You have the axis of symmetry, the vertex, and the graph to get full credit. Okay, now this brings us to the multiple choice questions that have to deal with the vocabulary. And like I said, these questions are, I think back when I was in high school, they used to give us problems that like, this is true always, sometimes, or never. And I think in the past, I used to give my students problems that would just be like, you know, if it's true or false, if it's false, give me a counter example. And I realized that uh, maybe sometimes people would leave that blank if they didn't understand it. And so I wanted to kind of give some halfway step in between just leaving this as a free response question, which I could do, and giving you something to kind of think about, some kind of way that you can lead yourself to understand the vocabulary. And this was my, uh, my effort at doing that. So understand that if it's true, then you just select it's true. And again, like I said, if you think it's true, then you should, you know, by now, you should kind of feel, you should trust some of your instincts and be like, okay, it's true. But I always feel like I can put any number of vocabulary words into an if-then statement and kind of stump a lot of people. And, you know, this is a pretty basic one. If we read this example, right, like I said, if it's not true, then you have to pick a counterexample. And so we're pretty clear about what this definition is. So let's talk about that, all right? It says, if a function is a quadratic function, then its vertex is at the origin. Now, if that was true, we wouldn't have so much trouble. Like, look at how much trouble we just put into finding a vertex, right? So wouldn't that be nice if every quadratic function just had its vertex at the origin? You know, unfortunately, the universe is more complicated than that. So I'm hoping that you could just cross that out right away and be like, nope, that's not true. Otherwise, I wouldn't have just spent maybe like three minutes, five minutes trying to find out where that vertex was on that last problem. So now that we know it's not true, we realize I have to find a counterexample. And again, a counterexample is something that makes the hypothesis true and shows the conclusion can be false. So in this case, we want something that is a quadratic function, but that doesn't have a vertex at the origin. Okay? So this is a non-example again down here, right? f of x, this is a linear function, not a quadratic function. So that can't be used at all. So we can cross that one out too. Now, and this one right here, x plus 0 times x minus 0, well, if you think about this, this is just x times x. And x times x just gives us x squared. And the graph of x squared does have a vertex at the origin, right? And so this is not a non-example, but it's definitely not a counterexample. Let me go fix that. Definitely not a counterexample. In this case, in this case, um, it would be an example. And so just because this is true sometimes definitely doesn't mean that it's true all the time. And so, like I said, this statement might be true sometimes. Sometimes a quadratic function does have a vertex at the origin, but not all the time. And so this is another one that we should cross out because it's just not true in this case, right? So now we can have this one eliminated and we could realize, hey, um, we have only one left and so maybe you could understand why this is the answer and we could talk about that just briefly if I was going to graph this intercept form equation we know that its zeros would be at negative 2 and positive 2 right and so I'd have a 0 right here and a 0 right there and again our axis of symmetry would be right down the middle so if I wanted to calculate that I'd have to plug in 0 0 minus 2 is negative 2 and 2 plus 0 is just 2. So I would be doing negative 2 times positive 2 
and that means that this would be right there at negative 4 and likewise if I drew my graph it would look like this and the vertex definitely would not be at the origin again the origin is the point zero zero right there in the middle so this couldn't possibly be um, true all the time right we've drawn parabolas all over the place so this would be a counter example right this does not have a vertex at the origin and it is a quadratic function so that's the kind of thought process that you need for this um, I think it does help if you understand how I designed the question and it does help if you know your vocabulary on this example as we think about it we we have to consider these ideas again of hypothesis and conclusion so we have if a function is a quadratic function okay so I better choose only something that's a quadratic function and in this case I see that this is not even a quadratic function this is a linear function again right something from math one so we cross that out that's not going to be something we could use here okay then we should also read the sentence and think about it right does this sound like it's true if a function is a quadratic function then its axis of symmetry is the y-axis so they concluded that every single parabola every graph of a quadratic function has to have an axis of symmetry that's the y-axis and that shouldn't really sound right because we've been looking for axes of symmetry in a lot of these problems and we don't always get x equals zero right another word for the x-axis is for the, sorry for the y-axis is x equals zero right like if you think about all these numbers x equals one x equals two x equals three x equals four this right here is x equals zero right so like let's say this would be the line x equals four yeah the y-axis right this is the x-axis and that's the y-axis but the y-axis is also the line x equals zero I mean if you consider it every single point on the y-axis has x equal to zero and so that's why we call that line x equals zero so we know that this does not have to be the only place that I can draw a parabola I could draw a parabola right here if I wanted and that doesn't have an axis of symmetry at the y-axis so you should definitely cross out that the statement is true, right? That's not a fact. We know this isn't true now. So we have to pick one of these two. And since you guys know how I design these problems, you could guess one of these is probably an example, and one of these is the counterexample. And so you want to figure out which one is which. And a diagram can help you do that. And in this case, it wouldn't even have to be like a full graph where you did everything. If you could just sketch one out really quickly, you can start to see the value of graphing when we're not doing everything completely precise. So if I wanted to do this one right here, we could try that one and think about it. Okay, wait, well, negative five, that's a zero over there at negative five, and then positive five, again, that's intercept form that I gave you, right? And so we have our zeros right there, and then we say, okay, well, where would my vertex be? Because that'd be halfway in between. And so I see, well, if I plugged in a zero, and I calculated f of 0 for this one, this would give me negative 5 times 5, right? And that means negative 25. So I'd have to go all the way down here to negative 25. And like I said, this is just a sketch. And so I don't have to be perfect with this, but it's perfect enough for us to, uh, enough for us to see, like, look, in this case, the axis of symmetry is the y-axis, right? It's halfway in between those two, right? So that tells me that this is definitely not the answer. This was the example, not the counterexample. So now that tells me that the answer should be A. And if you were to graph that, uh, you'd probably be able to tell, oh, look, um, halfway in between negative two, sorry, positive two and negative six, um, zero is not halfway in between that. So that would be your answer. For 27, the answer would be A. Now if we look at 28, we have a problem that more focuses on the structure of the question as opposed to any vocabulary really learned in the class. This set statement is telling us if you calculate the sum of a negative value and a positive value, you will get a sum of zero. So that says that if I add any positive and negative numbers, I have to get zero. Okay, that should sound ridiculous, so hopefully you can cross that out. But maybe 
if you weren't sure whether it was true or not, then you can start to analyze the responses that you could possibly put. Okay, seven plus negative seven, that's zero. And negative three x plus three x, that's also zero. So these are obviously examples of that. Okay, so maybe that doesn't tell us anything, but now you can look at D and say, wait a second, negative five plus 20, that's 15. And that's definitely not zero. So this is your counter example here. And now maybe you could start to see, hey, wait a minute, um, this statement is not true. And again, this is me trying to show you guys that in math, with a conditional statement like this, with the if then statement, for this statement to be true, it has to always be true. And by always, we mean that there's not even one case where we could show that it's false, all right? And in this case, we have one example where this is false. So we know it's not true. So that would definitely let you uh, cross out this one. And you know, once you find an example that disproves something, that's the whole idea of a counterexample. So once you've observed, hey, wait, negative five plus 20 is not zero. And that's a negative number and a positive number, right? If I add them, I don't get zero. So that's the answer. Uh, you should be able to recognize that by analyzing the possible responses here. Alright, this last one I think was me trying to focus on multiple things and you know these questions aren't necessarily easy to write. I don't want to feel like I'm throwing too many um, you know crazy ideas at you but if I put something in this section of the test it means that it's a big idea that you've probably seen many times before. And in this case, the conclusion is the idea of it having no linear term. So I guess I could have been more precise when I wrote that and said that the linear term has a coefficient of zero. Um, there's lots of ways to think about this. But, you know, if we did the work, you might wonder, like, wait, what is this talking about? And the factored form, all of these are in factored form right now. And they're all quadratic functions. So that means we don't have any non-examples so far that we can cross out, or do we? Because... We're looking for factored forms that are a difference of squares, okay? This one is a difference of squares because we have the only difference between these two binomials is the plus and the minus. This is not a difference of squares, right? This is x plus 3 times x plus 3. Again, here we have x minus 2 times x plus 7. That's also not a difference of squares. A difference of squares would have to be something like x minus 2 times x plus 2 or x minus 5 times x plus 5 or x minus 4 times x plus 4. I mean the only thing that's different in these examples is the minus and the positive, right? And so I try to get you guys used to this pattern so that this would be something that isn't so strange for you to see and we notice that this should make x squared minus 3 squared and again 3 squared is just 9. So to fully simplify that we could erase that and change it with a 9. And if you look at that, does this have a linear term? It does not have a linear term, right? We have a quadratic term, and we have a constant term. But there's no linear term. If we were to do the math and figure out why it doesn't have a linear term, then we could see that we practiced this a lot and you guys started to see the pattern. So if I multiply this out, we get x squared, then I get 3x. This time I'll get negative 3x multiplying those two together. And then lastly, I'll get negative 3 times positive 3, which makes negative 9. And now look, these two linear terms are going to cancel out. And so that's what I meant by it has no linear term. So in this case, what just happened? I mean, if I multiply this out, this has no linear term. So we've just seen, wait a minute, this right here, B, is a quadratic function that has a factored form and it's a difference of squares. So this makes the hypothesis true. And it has no linear term. So it makes the conclusion true. So it's definitely not a counterexample, right? This is an example. And then in that case, I'm not going to use that. And so you should be able to see that this is always going to be true. And so the answer is A, because we've eliminated all the other possibilities. So this is the way I want you to think about this. And I want to say that I think some students that have been paying extra attention on their worksheets and aren't going too fast, 
you probably should have been able to just look at this and be like, oh yeah, that's true. The difference of squares doesn't have a, a linear term, right? Like if I'm gonna do this one, I just have x squared minus four. If I was doing this one, I'd have x squared minus 25. If I did this one, we drop that parentheses, but if I did this one, we get x squared minus 16. We have a quadratic term and a constant term, but we have no linear term. And that brings us to the last problem on the test, which is something that um, we'll talk briefly about in this video and more about in class. But you know, the idea of always connecting these things to the real world, it's a big idea. And we are working on a project. We've seen many examples of how this works and we've just scratched the surface. We're gonna see a lot more examples of how polynomials can be used to model something in the real world. Um, I also mentioned that you could use a graph, a diagram, and a table to support your claims. So all I need is five sentences and we want it to make sense. But we've talked about lots of things in class. I mean, I could mention, you know, the slide that I brought up here at the beginning was a bridge that we have as like the, uh, the image for this video. And that, you know, we've seen several examples of bridges that we could model. We've seen arches we can model. We've seen castles. We've seen paintings that you could model. We've seen so many different things. We've seen that you can model population of a country using a polynomial. We've also seen that you can model you know, the several different things that have to do with data, maybe the population of a region, the number of tourists that come to a region. We've done graphs um, and there's still more to learn. And so uh, the big idea is that you bring some kind of coherent real world idea here. Um, you could draw a graph if you wanted. You could give me a diagram. You could make a table to try to break that down. If it's, you know, going to be a table of values such as like where we had, you know, like, oh, the population in 1770 and then the population in 1850 and the population in the 90s and then the population in 2023 and you have a table of data, you could maybe put that on the side and give me an example. You could draw a picture. Some of you guys are great artists. Maybe you could draw a quick little sketch and show me this bridge can be modeled maybe using a quadratic polynomial. Maybe you could talk about how higher order polynomials can um, describe more complicated curves that we see in the real world. So I think we also went on Desmos and we learned how if you adjust the coefficients, we can get our graph to fit whatever curve we wanted it to, to fit. And so some of this vocab can come into play, right? Coefficients degree, right, graph, curve, all of these different ideas that we've used um, can help us break down what's happening here. So, um, of course, the word parabola, which describes the pretty simple shape that we've been using, that's either going like this or downward like that. We've learned how to adjust the coefficients, and we're still getting these ideas, we're still mastering them. But this test is going to basically show me like who finishes with enough time left to write five sentences. Um, believe it or not, I think a lot of students are going are gonna to knock this out in the time limit and have more than enough time. So please, like I said, um, if you guys have all been working on your project, you have several examples that you could pull for this paragraph. Um, maybe use an example from your project. Every single one of you was supposed to make a, a Desmos image slide that has a graph on it. And so I know that you each have an example that you can use here. And even if you didn't, I know that I've showed you several examples of bridges um, or structures, rivers, whatever it is that we wanted to talk about that could be modeled using a polynomial. So like I said, um, we brought many ideas here, right? We had the idea of the Python brush in Amsterdam where we saw this polynomial that we used that got a pretty close model for the idea and then we had another bridge that we used okay and we see that you know the more complicated curve that we want to describe we can basically use um a higher degree polynomial to break that one down for us so i hope this is some kind of a help to you guys i hope those of you that have been absent from class um can use this to help you out a little bit to review uh, please, you know, note down some questions that you'd have 
And, you know, I wish you luck uh, in studying for this test. Um, see you later.